I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Embark on the transformative Hoppy 2024 tour and witness the remarkable evolution of economics, from the cultivation of crops to the dynamic world of stocks. Immerse yourself in the birthplace of commerce as we unveil the ingenious minds behind the first elaborate economic plans. Join us in Egypt from February 16th to the 25th, 2024, to experience this awe-inspiring journey where you will see and learn about innovations in agriculture. Marvel at the grand structures like the pyramids and the great temples, symbols of wealth and economic prowess in ancient Egypt. Experience the enchantment of Egypt with a chartered Nile cruise exclusively for our group. At the pinnacle of our tour, you will be granted access to the prestigious Hoppy Dinner Gala, where you can network with fellow travelers, scholars, and enthusiasts. Enjoy a night of opulence and culture as we unite to shape a prosperous future. Book now and join Hoppy on our economic tour of Egypt. Peace, peace, Hotep. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another exciting edition of Hoppy Talks. I'm your host tonight, Taki Grant. We have a very, very informative show for you tonight with no other than brother, Professor Kappa Hiawatha Kamene. Um, his brother is a very powerful, inspirational brother, been in the community for a very long time. Studied with some of the greats like Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Jay Carruthers, many others, legendary figures in our community. And he's an inspiration for us in this day and time. I've had the pleasure of meeting um, this particular brother maybe about 30 years ago almost now, or about 25 years ago, I would say. And um, since day one, he's always been a great inspiration in my life. Um, one of the most brilliant minds that we have in our community. And tonight we're gonna to be discussing something known as the economics of the revolution and why is that and so important a lot of times our revolutions are not funded or underfunded, which as we know, kind of usually equals a lack of unsuccess, uh, a lack of success, excuse me. So we need to talk about how we could fund these revolutions we have in our communities and other things. And what is the real impotence behind the things that we do, particularly on the economic front. All of those are, or may not be aware, we have the, Happy 2024 tour, discover the origins of economics in Egypt with Happy. So essentially important because it's not only talking about the fundamental aspects of economics, but it's all going to talk about how economics plays a role in what we do today and connecting the dots and making it real and making it plain for us. Um, when we think about some of the things we need to do to garner success or to have success in our community, economics is at the forefront. Um, Dr. J taught us and Hoppy and many other times talks about the, the uh, pyramid analysis, economics, politics, and culture. A lot of times in our community, economics is looked upon as something kind of far away. The politics is far away. We kind of gravitate to what I like to call the low hanging fruit in this instance, the culture piece. It's easy for us to change our names and carry unks and wear dashikis and oils and incense, things like that. But the other aspects of that pyramid analysis seem to be further, further away from us. We need to orient ourselves a little differently and kind of grab onto what we see as the foundation of civilization. It's the economics. And we see economics as beyond something beyond further, much more than just wealth. So we're not gonna go on too long. We're gonna definitely bring on the guests, but before we do that, um, definitely wanna just talk about this, what we see, this beautiful piece of artwork that we have in front of us, the Happy 2024 tour to Egypt, discover the origins of economics in Egypt with Happy, February 16th to the 25th. Well, those who are not registered and do and planning to do so, please do so now. Space is limited. Um, we have a lot of people already signed up. It's going to be a very exciting experience. We've been going back and forth to the now for almost three decades. And I have to say, this is one of my most exciting times in terms of what we're doing and how transformative um, this journey will be. In essence of just 
having an understanding of what really the point of all of this is. Uh, we're not just going to commit to who and ah at the great monuments, the legacies that our ancestors left behind, but we're also going to learn how they built those monuments and what was the foundation of that great civilization and how we can take that information and garner it and have success today. So this journey is more so about connecting the dots and making it real. So if you haven't signed up, please go to iCatTours.com and do so now. Um, also, we are having a merchandise sale on all our uh, merch in a happy store. Those people, we have the I have the great happy uh, compass here, all the directional aspects of happy. Uh, please take this opportunity or maybe after the show to go to happyfilm.com and take advantage of the markdown sale we have there. Those people who are not signed up for the newsletter, now may be a good time to do so, so you can stay in touch with all things happy. And lastly, we always talk about the foundation of what we do here in happy, and that is the happy film, the role of economics in the development of civilization. Please go get your copy now. All right, family, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and bring on our special guest tonight, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamini. Peace, family. Hotep to my brother Taki. Hotep, 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 Hotep. Kaba. How's everything with you? Everything is excellent. And Hotep to my sister Felicia and to all those who have tuned into this uh, program and who support Happy and all the great things that you all are doing to move forward. And I just want to begin by saying, as it relates to the economics of the revolution, a poor revolutionary leads a poor <laughs> revolution. Let's, let's understand that concept. And we should not expect things to come out if we don't put things in. Economics, Brother Taki, is a word that comes from, okay, I'm, I'm going to say Greek. We know the Greek don't have a language, but I'm going to leave it alone for now because I'd have to explain too many other things. But Economics comes from the Greek word oikos, O-I-K-O-S. It means home or environment. They picked this up from the African people. The evidence of it is they picked this concept up in Africa. Had they picked that up where they came from, they would have used that word where they came from. They only started using the word when they came upon, upon African folk who used that word. Oikos, it means your environment or your home, just like ecology is the study of your environment. Economics is the knowledge of your environment. And what our ancestors were saying basically is that your wealth comes from the land. It comes from nature. And that you build around nature. The thing that the Western civilization did in confusing their conceptual framework is that they built parks in city. Africans built cities in parks because they understood the wealth of their city would come from the environment of their nature. It's a totally revolutionary way of looking at the concepts that we're facing as a people right now. And as we move forward, family, we have to get very serious about what we're facing. Nature is not cruel, but she doesn't accept excuses. She understands the reasons, but she don't want to hear nothing. Nature understands that he has given us a set of cards. All of us have been given cards as it relates to what we do. Each and every one of our lives, we've been given like we're playing cards at a table. And we've all been given cards. I have had the experience of knowing people who have been given a very bad hand. And I have known people who have been given a very good hand. I have watched people that have been given a very good hand lose the game. And people who have been given a very bad hand win the game. So I've come to realize throughout my life that it's not the cards that you're given in life. 
that matter. It's how you play them. And as black folk, we have played our game real well. When you study our history, Brother Taki, when you see what we've been through, what we continue to go through, you can't help but admire, love, and respect us as a people. Even the brother or sister who is waiting for the light to turn red for a cup to come out to your car to ask you for a little bit of something to put in the cup. The fact that they're still alive for what their ancestry has gone through epigenetically, inter and transculturally through the generations. If you're black and alive in 2023, I got nothing but love and respect for you. But the question is, what are we doing? Because nature don't want to hear no excuses. She don't deal with excuses. He, nature, comes in both male and female, understands. I gave you a set of cards to play. Don't complain about the cards, just play them. And if you lose your hand, that's on you. Because I know folk that I gave a very bad hand. But it was that bad hand that made them smart enough to learn how to win the game against someone that had a very good set of cards. That's what we went through. Here in the United States of, of America, 13 colonies, if you want to call it that, can go up to the 50 states if you want to go that far. Every turn, everything was done to take us off course. Yet despite and in spite of that, brother, we made gourmet food out of the refuse that came from the big house. And everything we've done, you've done it the same way. Wow, that's powerful. So, you know, one of the things um, you actually, the... We, I, I saw that meme I just put up a little while ago and it, it inspired me to approach this topic in that way. A poor revolutionary can only lead a poor revolution. And am I saying it correctly? Yes, a poor revolutionary leads a poor revolution. Poor revolution. Yes. So I don't make sure. So before, before we get into that, family, please like, comment, and share. Um, uh, we're about to get into a very powerful topic tonight. I want to make sure that we make sure we get this out to as many folks as possible. Um, your support is is greatly appreciated. Uh, we got a lot of folks in the building already. Want to definitely make sure we get this out. Um, so Professor Cabo, as we as we look at that that topic, I just wanted to. I know you 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 kind of touched on it somewhat, but when we start to think about revolutions and their success or their failures. How much of it would you say would be equivalent to the economics of it, of it's going to work or if it's not? Well, the fact that we have not done what we're supposed to do, we have not yet done what we're supposed to do. Because we don't know our nature. We don't understand who we are as a people and how nature has all the answers for us. Money is not economic. Money is a means to use to get to where you want to go. But if you make money, let's just say that, and you buy things that you don't need, you already lost a revolution because you don't know your environment. One of the first things that we all should be doing, if you get any kind of money, you ought to be buying land. You ought to understand and respect your environment. Because that's what economics is. And so the fact that we are still tripping over ourselves. Earlier in your intro, you heard our brother, brilliant brother, Professor James Smalls, talk about how much we have spent as an economy in terms of money. But the fact is, is that if we made that much money, we're rich, but we're not wealthy. Rich is when the individual got cash. Wealth is when the family has land. And in that land, you don't own the land. You are merely the caretakers of the land on behalf of the Neturu in order to respect the land. And the land will love you as you love the land. The land will give you 
what you give it. Hmm. And so the fact that we are still in the positions that we are in, that we still have to request, there, there ought to be people that are just telling Hoppy, oh, what do you need? If we got all these millionaires making all this money and they'd rather be dripping chains and clothes and cars and houses, which not, none of that they're going to take with them when they join the ancestors, then what's your legacy that you're leaving? We have to be very serious about what we're looking at. And every generation hopes that that generation brings to the forefront what is necessary. And this is why if you ask me, okay, in, in my lifetime, what's an example of what you're talking about? I got to go back, blessings on our ancestor. I got to go back to Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Muhammad Ali and all of the actors and, act, um, actors and actresses that joined forces back in the 60s to create the type of economic system for the community. They did that back then. They had the money and they pooled it and they started doing things. Of course, whatever happened to it, okay, that's a whole nother story altogether. But we have had an example of it happening. And we got to bring all these folk together. All these people with money to understand the money is merely a vehicle to get you where you want to go. Money is to the human family as the mantra is to a meditator. The mantra is only important that it takes you to your higher levels of consciousness. The mantra is not important. It's what you do with the mantra that's important. So when I get some money, just came back from Atlanta, I made sure I went to Black Wall Street. I made sure I spent money with Black folk. I made sure that I went to Black restaurants, put money in their hand. I made sure that I did that. And if each and every one of us would do that in our own way, Support the black community and begin to give them the kind of funds that they need in order to make their restaurant, their clothing line, ancient aura jewelry, whatever it may be, make it so that they can become better instead of closing down after a few months because they don't get the support from the community. Ra evolution, revolution, Ra is the light and heat energy that comes from the sun. Evolution is the formation of life. It's Kepra. It's the process of becoming. Revolution is the process of becoming within the light, heat, and sound energy of the cosmic universe. And these are the kinds of things that we have to do as we move forward. And we have to understand. We expect to get something back, but we ain't put nothing in. And the same is true for the black um, uh, companies. You must respect your clients. People who are into business, who are of African descent, must respect their clients. We must offer them something that they, first of all, need in a way that the money that they have to give up is reciprocal to the product that they are receiving. Hmm. Wow. So just want to say a uh, happy family. I just want to say thank you to all those who are here in attendance. Um, you know, the time's a little late and those people come to hang out with us. We appreciate you. Um, Felicia and I, everyone are happy. Professor Cabo will speak for him as well. We all really, we appreciate you just being here with us. Um, you, you said a few things and, and one of the things I kind of wanted to touch on first was uh, nature gives you what you need. Right, you talked. We speak or spoke earlier about playing the hand that's dealt, mm. and I'm I'm listening to you speaking about the land will give you what you give it. Is there a connection there? That is the connection. That is the connection. That is the connection to love and respect. Even if you are in a project, respect the ground that you walk on, because even though it's covered with cement. It's still your environment. It's still your home. Respect it. 
Throw the refuse in a garbage can. Okay, don't throw a can on the side of the street. Respect it. Fundamentally, I'm talking fundamental now. These are just things that we all can do starting right now. No big plan. Respect your environment. Respect your community. Make it a safe place. And right. these, are, these are some of the things that we can begin to do right away. Because I know we all have plans and they're beautiful plans. Sometimes they're for the future. You know, when you aim for that star out there. Well, sometimes that star that you're aiming for is a little bit too high for you. But there are, there are intermediate stars that you can reach for and grab on that will take you to that major star. But if you try to leap for that big star right away, you might not reach it. But if you reach for the intermediary stars until you get there, so don't become overwhelmed. Because I'm going to tell you something. Western civilization is over. It's done. You can stick a fork. It's done. And every one of the civilizations that Indo-Europeans have created has fallen within 500 years of its creation. They have never been able to maintain a civilization more than 500 years, starting with the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And it was Africans that had to go in in 711 and wash these funky people, give them some alcohol to disinfect their funkiness so they didn't spread all them pandemics all around. And then by... Uh, 1492, they were ready to bite the hand that fed them. And from when the Moors left January 2nd, 1492, Europe has never been the same again. And all they've done is tumbled out of control until here we are, 2023. And even the enemy of my enemies are acting like my friends. Even the people that are against me are against themselves politically and everything else it's done they did not they did not ground themselves in ma'at no truth no justice no harmony no balance order and arrangement that's out the window and they never understood reciprocity because what go around come around and that's exactly what's happening right now what goes around comes around you shall reap what you sow what you give is what you're going to get and they're getting it. And I'm telling us, don't do what we did in 7-Eleven. Okay? Don't save them. Let them go. But family, what are we doing? Are we in a position to have our own economic system? Our own education system? Can we govern ourselves with dignity and respect? How about brothers and sisters? Are we getting along with each other so that we respect and understand the power of commitment in family? Human beings create nations families create dynasties nations rise and fall but dynasties last forever what we want to create we have to understand this and and understand what our ancestors understood when they built these dynasties what were the dynasties that they built it's powerful and we got this, my brother Taki. Sister Felicia, we got this. You know, sometimes things are in your hand, but if you ain't looking in your hand, you don't know you got it. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. We've had this. In fact, I believe we were brought here over 400 years ago to get this. And now we're here. But what are we doing? Are we supporting each other? So, Professor Kaba, I just want to just kind of just go back for a second, because you said something that I think that most people will probably find interesting or, you know, garner some insight from. You um, you invoked the 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 uh, spirit of what occurred in the '60s surrounding Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, another um, conscious um, um, individuals who created an economic system, or created a system for us. Can you? Touch on a little bit more. Give us a little more context of what occurred there. 
Well, let me give you a side analogy, and then I'll go back and tell you that. But let me give you another side analogy. Suppose all the rap artists and all of the so-called black billionaires and millionaires held a press conference. I, I don't want to name any names because I don't want to pull anybody out. But what I want to talk about is suppose all the sports figures in football and in basketball, baseball, Suppose the actors, the, the A actors that are with us today, suppose they all had a press conference and said, here is a fund that we're going to create. Okay. Now I understand people want to put together a whole bunch of money to help Hawaii. I'm all for that. Because I know the original Hawaiians were black too. So I understand that. But what about your people? Suppose you put together something where you put a percentage. If you want to go to church and tithe 10%, suppose everybody took 10% of their money and hired people like Dr. Claude Anderson hmm. and, and other economics, male and female, to come together. Give them that pool of money and say, okay, give us direction as to where we got to go. Where can we go now? How could we put this together? What are the economic boundaries and scaffolding that we can put together? And suppose they said, uh, you know, Brother Kaba, we hear you doing a lot in education. Okay. What would it take for you to put together a curricula that we could go into the churches, we could go into the after school centers, we could go into the various areas and we could implement this culture? Because you see, Ain't nobody worried about Ron DeSantis. In fact, I think he was a gift to us. I honestly think that Ron DeSantis did more for us than most people have done in laying out what he laid out. Because he told us something that very few of them are willing to admit. Hmm. I have treated black folk horrible. Our history in America towards black people has been demonic, but you ain't teaching that to my children and all them books that are going to prove it, we banning them. That was such a strong message to me. I'm going to Jacksonville in November. I want to talk to them in Jacksonville. I want them to understand what they can do because this curriculum is in place. I've already got the curriculum. If you go to my Quibinar series, I got 63 Quibinars, quick webinars that deal with the Africanization of teaching methodologies. Because in this Western system, not only do they teach you the wrong thing, they teach you the wrong thing the wrong way. It is not conducive to the way the neurons work in the brain, particularly with children, specifically with melanated children. I got this. I'm not worried about it. Now, whether or not this generation is going to call on me to do it, that's a whole nother thing. I'll, I'll, I'll bide my time. Because I ain't going to do it wrong. And I ain't going to do it half-assed. I'll tell you that right now. It's either going to be done the right way or you have to excuse me from the room because I'm not going to do to our people what has been done to them. Everybody wants to negotiate and everybody wants to get into compromise. There is no compromise in the black mind. And when you start compromising with the black mind, you are compromising with nature. And when you compromise with nature, nature is going to take care of you. So that these are the kinds of things that we have to look at. Now, I was a young man when this happened. It, it, it happened particularly around the time that Muhammad Ali refused to go into the military. Specifically around that. And in fact, I think it might have been him that everybody was rallying around to create that power. Um, you know, the movie came out not too long ago about that night uh, with 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 uh, um, Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, Sam Cooke. You know, rem you know, you know, you know, remember that movie that came out? Sister directed it. Yeah, that was the one with um, him and Malcolm. Um and oh, Malcolm X, yeah. Yeah. If anybody okay. knows the name of it, please put it up. I can't think of it right now. That's the one Regina King directed. That's right, Regina King. Oh, okay. I lived during that era. I remember when those I didn't know the backstory now. 
But I remember when that happened. And I remember looking, not since I saw the Black Panthers walk into the uh, uh, legislature building with guns on their shoulder had I been impacted by Black folks so powerfully. One Night in Miami is the name of the film. Yes. Thank you, family. See, when we're all together, everybody got the answer. <laughs> That's why study groups are so important. <laughs> But the bottom line is that that was an example of four powerful people coming together one night, sports and entertainment. Malcolm as an activist, okay, just came together. And they decided that they were going to do something. And pretty soon it grew. And they all came out and they protected and defended Muhammad Ali. And so... If we should take that to today and have a meeting in Florida and have all these individuals come. And I understand they're saying, okay, we want to boycott. Okay, I understand that. But if we boycott Florida, how many black folk are we throwing to the wind? I don't want to run away from the problem. I want to jump into the problem. And we can do this. In fact, you know, Brother Taki, in Florida, Dr. Asa Hilliard and I, in 1989 to 1994, we went to Broward County and developed a multicultural program that dealt with African history and culture. We were brought down there for four to five years and we worked together. And every morning, Dr. Hilliard and I would meet in the Days Inn cafeteria over a cup of coffee and we talk about, well, he was my teacher, so I listened to him. But I was explain because I was brought in to work with the teachers. He was brought in to work with the administrators. And so when he found out that we were going to be coming together jointly, we he called me and said, listen, let's meet somewhere. Let's talk so we can get on uh, code. And so we used to meet. And I would explain to him, I would show him my curriculum and how we developed it. And he would show me what he was going to tell the principals and the superintendent and everybody else. And we would coordinate it. One time we, we went to lunch with the superintendent, the deputy superintendent, a lot of the principals, director of, of, of cultural education and director of social studies for, for Broward County, Fort Lauderdale. And the superintendent said at the meeting, directing it to Dr. Hilliard, Nana before Amat Twakia, he said, you know, it's been said that it, it's almost like the two of you meet and discuss what y'all are going to do because you are all on such code. With, well, he, he didn't use the word code, but you, you speak in unison. And Dr. Hilliard being a psychologist, okay, uh, he just, oh, is that right? Okay. He just let it fly over. Didn't look at me, you know, didn't give me no high sign. Like, you know, Hey, you know, I said nothing. I just sat there. I was, you know, I, you know, I was eating my soup, so I didn't say nothing. But later on, we, we had it. And we, and for five years we were developing this. That's what Ron DeSantis dismantled. Mm. Well, you know, this is actually one of my goals. Brother Taki, what we can do. And I know why they dismantled it. And that's the curriculum that I've professionalized. And I'm going to Jacksonville to talk to them about how they can implement it. And I'm, I'll am i go any place in the world and tell people how you can implement this program. And we don't need them. I just need our communities to support this. I have a dream, brother. And then I'm going to stop for a moment. I have a dream that I'm going to get enough money together to be able to offer students in the Black Studies Departments, African Studies Department, and Education Departments in the HBCUs. And I want to take the curriculum that I've developed, and I want to be able to go into the communities. It has to be free, because HBCUs ain't going to pay for this. <laughs> 
So I know it has to be funded by a group that has the kind of money to say, brother, I like your style. I like what you're doing. Your curriculum is in place. And what we're going to do is that tell me what you need. And I'm and I'm going to write up what's called an RFP, a request uh, uh, for proposal. And I will encumber the money. See, because I'm not going to say, OK, give me this amount of money. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give them a budget. I'm going to tell them where every penny that you're spending is going to go. Because see, this is how we get in trouble. We get a little bit of money and then we start using it on things and people say, well, where did this go? Well, where did that go? When you encumber your budget, because I've encumbered budgets with the Board of Ed because I've had programs before, so I know how to put it together. You encumber your budget where those that you are spending money with know exactly where every penny is going to go. From airfare to lodging uh, to my own personal honorarium to the uh, to, to the curriculums that would be given to the students for free. And I want those students as a student teaching process to go into the local elementary, junior and high schools and teach the children what they're learning through the program that we've implemented. That's how they can pay us back. There ain't no money in this. This can be done. So <clears throat> you you I just want to come back to this uh this project you was working on with Dr. Hilliard. Okay. Uh, just just let's get this let's let's start here. Uh, you may have mentioned it before. I'm sorry, I think I missed it. What year was this? This would have been from 1989 to about 1994. And it sets the stage for the current or now former um, educational or uh, curriculum, African-centered curriculum in Florida. In, uh, in, in Fort Lauderdale. In Fort Lauderdale. Broward County. It, it, it moved a little bit into Miami, uh, but it didn't take as much hold because of certain situations in Miami. But in Fort Lauderdale, it was very powerful. And for five years, we went there. And we would meet. Sometimes he would go and I wouldn't be there. Sometimes I would go and he wouldn't be there. Many times we both went the same time. You know, I'll always remember when our brother Huey P. Newton, let me tell you what happened. We were doing a joint presentation one afternoon. We were wrapping things up. We were ready to go our own separate ways. We were doing a, a uh, readout with the people involved. Um, administrators were there. Teachers were there. Represent representatives of each group. And I remember I spoke and then Nana before Dr. Hilliard started talking. And somebody motioned at the door for me to come. And I went over to the door and I picked up, they, they, they gave me a piece of paper and they said, read it. And I, and I opened it up and I read it. And then they said, give it to Dr. Hilliard. When I went back to my seat, I held on to it because I knew he and Huey P. Newton were friends. I wouldn't give it to him. They kept, you know, trying to get me to give it to him and I, and I wouldn't give him the paper. After he finished and he was comfortable in his finishing, then I gave him the piece of paper. Because I wasn't going to knock him off of his train of thought. That was the day that Huey P. Newton died. Mm. And that's what the slip of paper said. Huey P. Newton had just died in uh, California. I believe it was California. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I wouldn't give him. That's how I remember that date all the time. Because we were together that day. And afterwards, when we spoke, in fact, he went his way. He went back to uh, Georgia and I went back to New York. We spoke afterwards and he thanked me for holding on to it. Because he said, you know, brother, that would have just kind of wiped me away if I had seen that. He said, man, I had to go back to my, uh, um, uh, well, he went straight to the airport. He said, but man, he cried like a baby in, 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 in the cab. You know, that reminds me of uh, Dr. Clark's testimony when he got the nerve of the news that Malcolm X was assassinated. Yeah. I remember it well. I remember it well. He was having dinner with a family friend. And when he found out, he went into the bathroom. He said he cried like a baby. He cried like a baby. 
because him and Malcolm was close. Very close. Yeah. Oh, family, please like, comment, and share. I mean, as you can see, this is, is one of those types of discussions. Um, yeah, and I want to give a shout out to all the people who are um, showing their support through the cash apps. Um, there's other ways to show support. Obviously, like, comment, and share. Cash app, super chats, and um, stars. Um, we greatly appreciate all the love and support um, that we can that we get from you guys. Um, also, please support this powerful elder here. Um, we actually have his his caption information as well, and um, we're gonna make sure we put keep putting that up on the screen so people can can take advantage of that. Um, in this economic thing. Um, Professor Kaba, we talk about it quite a bit. And, you know, my my first memorable recollections of, of, of being with you and your presence and being at your lectures was talking about how fundamentally important it is to teach economics to children. And I remember specifically um, you using your son, Haru, who's a, who's a great man now, but he was a, he was a youngster at the time. And some of the things, some of the creative things that he was doing at a very young age to just understand the aspects of economics, That's not necessarily to make money, but just to understand it. And, you know, you use him as an example. And I always remember that and, and you know, seeing what who he is now, he's, you know, he's a very, very, you know, special person. So, you know, one of the things in, in leading into that, you said something that was very poignant um bringing the different economists together male and female and give us a direction for where we got to go and um that that for us is what inspired us to do what we're doing in february bringing the different minds together and talking about where we need to go taking an understanding of who we are in our past and bringing it in with our economics to really really kind of set the roadmap up and as we kind of move into that um, I want to kind of talk about some of the um, some of the economics of of the now, especially as it relates to some of the civil engineering projects that they had in ancient Kemet, and how vitally important those things were. The concept, when you're looking at, I don't use the term Egypt, so to speak, and I don't necessarily rely on the first dynasty because we know that um, people have many different charts of the dynastic periods of Kemet. And one of the examples that I use is the fact that uh, Peggy Brooks Bertram wrote an essay and I think it's in Egypt Revisited, where she talks about the sixth Napatan dynasty. We call it the 25th Egyptian dynasty. But the reality of it is that when Indo-Europeans came upon Africa through coming into uh, Kemet, they came at a certain time that was late in Kemetic history. So their first introduction would have been who they decided to list as the first dynasty. There really is no such thing as a first dynasty. What is called the first dynasty really is a continuation of the Kushite dynasties that came up through Kustal. And those Africans move north to Edfu, to the temple of Heru. And they continue to move up until they got to a place called Hikapata. Hikapata, which means the spirit or the essence of Pata, the creator of creators. And what Menefer, who is credited to be the first. Neset Biti or Pharaoh is really not the first Pharaoh. He comes from a lineage of people that came before him that was moving from north to south. But the Kush Kemetic legacy 
they knew geologically that there was a specific spot that we would call, that they called Hikapata. Today is called Memphis. For those that are going on the tour, when you get to the pyramids, this is what I want you to remember. Through hydraulics and through the understanding of the water of the Hapi, having come from inner Africa, See, they knew the flow of the river. Indo-Europeans didn't know the flow of the river. They came in and came in contact with the first interruption of the river known as the first cataract. But the first cataract really is the sixth cataract because you've got to number things according to chronology so that what's the sixth cataract in Kush or Nubia is really the first cataract. The fifth is the second. The fourth is the third. The third is the fourth. The second is the fifth. And the first is the sixth. But the Kushites understood this. Now, let me tell you something else before we even go here. If it were not for the Twa and Buti Khoisan people of Central and Southern Africa, the Kush Kemetic people wouldn't exist. The Kush Kemetic people are a, 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 a transformation of the knowledge and wisdom that was given to them by the original family on the planet, who we call the Twa Mbuti Khoisan of Central and Southern Africa, derogatorily called pygmies. So we got to give credit to the early people who understood the flow of the river from the most ancient of times and passed on this information to, to future dynasties and families that would come into existence so that the Kush Kemet people pushing north knew exactly where they wanted to go. And the example and the purpose of it deals with agriculture. And that becomes important. Agri, land, culture, to cultivate to build. And so the Kush Kemetic people knew that there was a specific area that they needed to build up. So what they did is that the, the scientists and the hydrolysis, the people who were into water, what they did is that they created an elbow in the Hopi River. So the Hopi River went straight. What they did is that they bent the river to create land here because that would become very important and that is Hika Pata. And Pata being a hill, it's like he dumped up land because he knew that he was going, his future generations was going to build something. See, I got a hundred year plan, family. I'm not just thinking about today. I'm thinking about a time when my great, great, great grandchildren will pick up my roadmap. Dr. Clark used to oh, always tell me, you may not get to your, well, he told us, but I remember him telling me personally when I was doing different things, you may not get to your destination, but if you leave the proper roadmap, those that come behind you will continue your journey. And so my study guide on my website, that's my journey. That's where I'm headed as it relates to the books and the themes and everything else that I think that we should be getting into as it relates to education, www.kabakamane.com. So what Menefer did is he created a, an elbow in the Hopi River and dumped up land, knowing that dynasties later, there would be somebody such as Imhotep that would master the mathematics. When Imhotep built the step pyramid, all he did was take what they already had and just refined it. So they had these mastabas, which is like, um, like what we have now when we bury people inside the cemetery and we put their body in there, things like that, mastabas. But in his mathematics, he realized that if he took another mastaba, and mathematically correct, 
built it smaller than the one underneath, there would be a relationship between the run to rise ratio. Then he built a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, and a sixth one. But all of the relationships were the same. So the run A and the rise B of the bottom one was the same run to rise as the second one, even though it was smaller, same run to rise going all the way up. But he laid out the mathematics that would allow his descendants or ascendants, such as Seneferu, such as um, uh, Khufu, Kafra, and Menkara, to then take that concept to the next level, which would say that the run to rise ratio can now be a formula known as y equals mx plus b, which equals what's called finding the slope. And that was the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Thousands of years before Ptah Goras. His name wasn't Pythagoras. It was Ptah Goras. So that they laid out generationally the plan. But here's the key going back to the economics, my brother Taki. Everything that the... Everything that the Kush Kemetic people did was to feed into the building of these pyramids because they knew if they were bakers, they baked for the people of the community. If they made clothes, they made clothes for the people of the community. If they were masons, they made uh, bricks for the building of the pyramids. If they were engineers, Whatever it was, if they were workers, everything that the society did went into building the pyramid or the Meru, as our brother Tony Browder calls them. And in so doing, what would happen is that the funds that were made or however they bartered or whatever they did, it is what brought the ability for the community to survive because they knew their economic. They understood their community. So with that in mind, what I'd like to recommend is that we don't have to build the pyramids because you see the pyramids are built for many different reasons. But one of the main ones is for astral agriculture. Because the entrances of the three pyramids are on the north side and they all point to the north star. They were all built so precisely that the wherever the uh, the shadow that was cast on the pyramid the community knew what season they were experiencing hmm. and so they were able to use agriculture as a way to grow the food and to do the work and to create the technology that would come into this now what i am saying i'm recommending let us look at schools for our community and children and let that be what we look at to build the society. So if you are a chef or a baker, you're the one that feeds the community working on the schools and you feed the children in the schools. If you're into making clothes, you're the ones that make the outfits because them outfits that our children are wearing, they're not into too much. You know, our children need to be looking drip. They don't want to be looking like that. They want to drip. And so we need to make the uniforms for our own children. And so that gives job to the tailors. Whatever we do, even if we candlestick makers, put that towards the schools. And build the school as the centerpiece to the building of the society itself. Earlier, somebody said, should white teachers teach our children? I'd like to respond a little bit differently by saying, I think black people should be teaching black children. And until we start teaching our own children, other people will be able to teach our children. And so I'd like to go more proactive in the conversation. Because the bottom line is, is that if we don't have and I'm on a crusade for brothers in particular, 
young brothers. I want them brothers to come up on this. I want them to go to school to become a teacher. As someone who was an early childhood teacher, I can tell you, my kindergarten children, some of them said, I wish you were my daddy. You look like my daddy. Can I call you daddy? And I said, I am your dad. Because the African tradition says every adult male in the community is Baba. And every adult female is Mama. I didn't bring you into this world. I'm not your biological father. But as long as you're in my presence, I'm responsible for you. And this is how I worked my relationship out with the children. For 31 years, brother, I was with children in South Central Bronx. For 14 years, I was a college professor. I've taught every grade. I've taught every subject. I got this in education. Now, when it comes to computer, I need Haru to help me out. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know, I think one thing about being an what I believe to be an intelligent person is to know your strengths and to know areas where you're not strong. But go out and get the best mind to help you do what you need to do. And so I've always been one when I see folk get out on the court, they got game. They know they got game. They own their greatness. This is how I feel in education. I got this. I know how to do this. You can look at my webinars. You can look at my webinars. And you can see I'm very comfortable in education. I'm very comfortable right now. Because I'm in my space. I'm in my classroom. I, I know because of experience. And my experience comes from our people. This ain't about necessarily me. This is what I have learned from our people. And I am reflecting the greatness of our children. You know, I think we actually may have crossed paths too in the South Central Bronx. I was in, what was that 163 on Webster Avenue? Oh man, yeah. One I like, I, I, Art Aronstein was principal there. <laughs> well, I think I left with like maybe 80, 81. Well, I started teaching 79. I was at 229 in 81. And then I became a uh, assistant principal. Then I became an administrator. But then I became director of, uh, of social studies and I visited schools. And when I visited schools, 163 was one of them. Right up there. Because I, um, I was at Diana Sands at Claremont. Okay. You know, right across from Claremont Park. Diana Sands, um, 147. CIS 147, which was just south of you. At, at, at 163. And I used to walk the streets. I, you know, I used to walk from school to school. The community knew me. Even if they didn't have children in the school, they knew me. And I used to stop and talk to them. I would stop. <laughs> I, I would teach on the corner, man. On, a, on, <laughs> on 174th and 3rd Avenue. I would just start talking. You know. It was a different world back then, too. Oh, man, it was a whole nother world. But you know something? The same world exists today. It's just that our perception of the world is very different. Because I still stop on the corner and talk to people every so often. It's, it's, it's different now because of what, how people relate to me. But back then, they didn't know me. You know, there was no hidden colors. There was no outer darkness. They, you know, they just knew me. Hey, man, that's that brother that's always be talking about Africa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Professor Kaba, we um, we we talked a, um a bit about um pyramids, and I, I love your explanation on the evolution of pyramids, starting from the the earliest um, stages. You know, when we think about the, uh, I just want to just kind of share this real quick, the Mastabas hmm. and, and you know, just kind of going forward. So now that people can kind of see some of the, I just wanted to kind of make sure, because, you know, for some of the family who may not be aware of these, the structural references, so I wanted to just make sure they kind of have opportunity to see it as we kind of just maybe um, summarize it quickly in, in terms of what the significance is and, and how it relates to the, the foundation of the civilization and, and the economics of it. 
do you have a photo of uh and do you see the step in there well there's a run to rise ratio from when you look at the one that's on top of the other one it's smaller so the run goes in from the edge of the one on the bottom to the to where the other one begins and then it rises up then you put another one up there that's smaller than the second one and from where that one ends to where the third one begins that's the run and then you go up and that's the rise but what happened do you have a picture of the perfect pyramid oh uh, yeah i'm sure i can get one <laughs> it's not a problem that perfect pyramid was the completion of what was created by Imhotep. See, we can't lose sight of what the plan was from Menefer of the so-called first dynasty until Imhotep of the third dynasty to the fourth dynasty. They were all related as scientists. And they understood exactly what they wanted to do and where they wanted to do it. And so when you look at the perfect pyramid all they did was fill in those sides of the step pyramid. And so the a squared plus b squared you create the slope y equals mx plus b. You create the slope that then is going to fill in the step until you get a perfect pyramid. Now the way in which you get the perfect pyramid in place is the fact that when you look at the perfect pyramid each side of the perfect pyramid is a 755 feet long each side 755 feet now the north side is 755.88 the south side is 755.43 and the east and west side is 755.77 so they're not exactly the same size because you got to have give and take in your structure so they understood that as engineers and as technologists 755 feet basically if you wanted to know how tall it is it's about a 75 foot building if you say that every story is 10 feet 755 feet so when you all are standing in front of those pyramids each side is like you took a, a 75 story building and turned it on its side each side that's how huge this structure was this is how brilliant our ancestors were to put this together but here's the math of it if you took half of the perimeter of khufu's pyramid and divided it by its height, 481.4 feet. If you took half of the perimeter, now the way you solve for perimeter, perimeter is equal to 4S, or it's equal to 2L plus 2W, however you want to look at it. Okay? 481.4 feet. If you took half of the perimeter of Khufu's pyramid and divided it by its height, it's equal to 3.14, okay? Each side of that pyramid is a 75-story building turned on its side. For those of you who have been there, you know how big this is. In a picture, it doesn't look that big. But when you get up on that pyramid, you see how massive it was built. And when nobody using nothing that was going to stick them stones together, they put, that, they put it together so that it stood on its own. But what built the pyramid as it relates to the math that was perfected, remember from the first dynasty to Imhotep's math to the fourth dynasty, Senefru tried it, but he had a bent pyramid. The math didn't quite work for him, but his son Khufu made it, but they needed three pyramids and they needed three smaller pyramids. And you know the way the Western world talks. Everything male is big and everything female is small. That's not the king's pyramids and the feet and, and the queen's pyramids. That that had nothing whatsoever to do with it. So so once we just put that in the trash, we'll understand. 
Our ancestors built because these were lines of sight into the heavens. Uh, you know, I mean, the three pyramids alone are in alignment with Orion's belt. Not to mention what the others are. Plus the north side, they all point to the north star, which meant that they understood the rotation of the earth. And by the way, the earth is not tilted 23 and a third degrees. That's nonsense. Because when you get up in the space, there's no such thing as the earth being tilted. Because everything is equal. <laughs> These folk are not bright family. You better be careful if you're going to follow them. Because they <laughs> Oh. These folk have very serious problems, mental problems, and they, they 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 have a very interesting way of not being able to express the most natural understandings of the world. And this is why we're in the position we're in today, because they never got it right. And so when you're looking at the pyramid and you're looking at pi, but check this out, fam. When you learned about pi, how did you learn about pi? I'll tell you how I learned about it. I learned it by the uh, circle. Pi equals the circumference divided by the diameter. That was equal to pi. But I just showed you pi in a square. So what really happened was our ancestors were such geniuses, males and females family. This, this ain't a man-dominated thing right here. Sisters were engineers too. That, that has to be understood. Sisters were as dynamic in the movement of the Kush Kemetic legacy as any other group of people. We've been around them too long. We start looking at our women a certain way and we don't understand. For every question that will ever be asked, half of the answer is female. And half the answer is male. So if you want the full answer, you better go to a sister to ask or sisters go to a brother to ask. And so the genius of our ancestors in building this structure is what I ask us to begin to do in building a school for our community and for our children, if you want to focus on something, and then if you really want to focus on something, focus on solar power. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. Because because we're going to get up off these fossil fuels. Because the fossil fuels ain't nothing but black carbon anyway. Because they're all the remnants of all the living things that have existed. And it's black. That's why oil is black. And then what do we do? We chemicalize it and make it gasoline. Because we ain't got no sense when we're doing this. We, we're going to have to get up. And the fossil fuel is good for the earth. For us to drain the earth of fossil fuels for gasoline is equivalent to sticking your finger down somebody's throat to make them vomit. You leave the earth alone. And you go to the sun. Because the sun got all the power that you need. Hmm. And there's a lesson plan that I have on Aten's text, who was a Neset Biti of the 18th dynasty, where the Aten text is a code to the sun. It's an ode to the sun. It's called the hymn to Aten. And, and in this prayer, they're talking about all the power and the majesty of the sun and its purpose and why it exists and that it is hail to the Aten, who gives us the power on the earth to have everything that we have. And you see the sun is Western civilization's enemy because they stay in the sun, they get melanomas. Black folks stay in the sun, our battery gets recharged. And so this is Ra's evolution. <laughs> it is solar power. There'll be no air that they can put at the end of your name to measure your wealth. No millionaire, no billionaire, no trillionaire, because for as long as there is sunlight, you will be very wealthy because everything you derive, everything that you need, the sun gives you. Because first of all, the sun gave you life. The sun created the earth and the planets and the asteroid belts. We got to go science family. And if anything that I've said 
might be new to you, I have to blame your fifth grade teacher. Because <laughs> my fifth grade students understood this. We used to talk about solar panels. We got to make this happen. Listen, we said it in the beginning, like, comment, and share, because it's going to be a powerful discussion. I don't know if all of you guys believe me, but as you can see, my mind is a little blown right now. So, Bob Cobb, you've underscored so many different things. Um, in, in, in family, when we speak of discovering the origins of economics in, in, in Kemet with Hoppy, Bob Cobb just knocked it out the park in terms of what that looks like and underlining it. But he also talked about things we need to do now that are solution-based, understanding technology and solar panels, understanding the importance of building schools and building pyramids of today, which in his words are equivalents to schools. And that's so very important because everything we need to do needs to have a, a solution or an answer to it. We just can't look at this history and marvel over it without trying to correcting or getting back to where we once was. And I, I, I love your, your anecdotal um, measures in terms of, of schools and, and teaching solar energy. When I think about ancient Kemet and the things that they did to harness economics, rather through the land and also through the sun and how they were able to utilize that in such a masterful way, mastering their, their, their ecology, understanding their ecology to build their economy. And that is the lesson and message that we have in, in, in Hopi. Um, well, I just want to just touch on one quick thing before we move on. Uh, Pythagoras, what is the correct pronunciation of the name again? Well, I say pata ka ra Okay. But again, and the other thing that I'd like to say to us is this. Every generation, because of my focus on William Leo Hansberry, who was my first book that I wrote, Dr. Clark recommended that I do a, uh, you know, my paper on him. So I turned my paper, I, I, I did two degrees on him. And I combined the two degrees and created the book on William Leo Hansberry. And what William Leo Hansberry did as a professor at Howard University in the early 20s, he did not have what we have today. He created maps of Ethiopia. He had students who were in the Department of Art who would draw maps that never existed about Ethiopia. He wrote curricula around West Africa, stories that had never been told before. And so I honored Professor Hansberry. There are areas in my research that I have been able to complement his work and attempted to take it to the next level. The same is true for all of the other scholars that have come into existence, such as John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef ben Yikin and Dr. Sharshi McIntyre. All of the scholars that have come and, and moved, they may be ancestors now. The work that I'm doing, there's a lot more accuracy to be made to my work. And what I'm doing is to bring the knowledge to the people, particularly the younger generation, for them to perfect what it is that I'm doing. Take it to the next level. Just as I'm trying to take other people's work, much praise. I, I send my regards to a good friend of mine who taught me so much, Dr. David M. Hotep, who just joined the ancestors. Dr. David M. Hotep honored and respected Dr. Ivan Van Sertema to the point where he took Dr. Van Sertema's work to the next level. And so we have to start to look at this work. I know a lot of people want to come out and they want to put the bad word out on some of the elders. They want to put the bad word out on some of the scholars. Um, they, they really think that they know more. But the reality of it is, is that if you can see me, if I'm on this show because you can see me, it's because I am on the shoulders of those that came before me. And so what I ask is to take my work to the next level. That's why I've got that study guide up. Take my work to the next level. 
Don't tell me I'm wrong. Just tell me I could be more accurate. Because I know I'm right. <laughs> but I could be more accurate. So when you ask me about Pythagoras, Pythagoras, okay? That's how I put that name together as it relates to other documents that I have read by other scholars. Now, is that accurate? Time will tell. That's what's accurate to me, to the information that I have up to right now. Same with Dr. Shekhanta Diop. Dr. Shekhanta Diop was a genius. He was a multi-genius. There are areas that can be improved in his work. But he laid it out for us to improve it. Don't prove him wrong. Prove how he was right. But here's what you can add from research that you've come upon to build on his genius. Because ain't nobody going to be another Sheikh on the Dia. There's not going to be another Dr. Ben. Now, you talk about economics, Brother Taki and Sister Felicia. You want to talk about economics. There's a story that I've always told about Dr. Ben. That many times we focus on Dr. Ben as the one that brings us to commit and teaches us great information. But Dr. Ben changed the economic conditions of black folk in Egypt. Because when my first trip was in 1983, okay. My second trip was in 1987. In 1987, we stayed, uh, when, when we went down uh, to Abu Simbo, you know, we stayed south and we stayed at the Oberoi. But we were such a big group. That's when uh, ASCAC and others had their conference. And some of us stayed at the Oberoi, and then some of us stayed at the old cataract, some stayed at the new cataract. This was a trip where Gil Noble, the producer of the, of the uh, weekly television show, like it is, he came with us. Uh, Dr. Clark came with us, and Dr. Ben came with us. Okay. The thing that people may not, know particularly now about Dr. Ben is that he was a living legacy. Every elderly African-American man that spoke English, all the Nubians thought they were Dr. Ben. You Dr. Ben? You Dr. Ben? Because everybody thought that was Dr. Ben. And Dr. Ben, people searched for him. Nubians searched for Dr. Ben. He had a name. I'm telling you what I know. I was there. And so... To this day. To this day, yes, absolutely. His name still rings bells in Egypt to this day. That's it. Still, and that's what he started long time ago by what he did before he ever was taken us to commit. So that I was with a brother named Muhammad. He had a felucca, a boat called Christmas. And he and I became friends. And I used to get on the felucca with him and he would take me up and down, happy and tell me different things and tell stories. He lived in the community behind the Oberoi Hotel. And one time I was telling him that I had to leave a little early because I had to go to a meeting where Dr. Ben would be. He said, Dr. Ben going to be there? I said, yes. He said, can I come? I said, sure. So I told him what time to meet me. We met. We were going over to the cataract. And, you, you know, when the cars come in, they, you know, you know, they got this thing that stopped them. Well, um, there was a brother, there was a Nubian brother, African, that was at the post. And I was with uh, Muhammad and Muhammad and I were walking and I kept walking, not realizing that Muhammad had stopped. I turned around and I saw Muhammad and I turned around and I went back and I said, Muhammad, don't you want to go? He said, yeah, but I can't. I said, why, you know, why can't you go? He said, because Nubians aren't allowed in the hotel. Well, look, man, I had a Mississippi flashback right then. You telling me because you black, you can't get into this hotel? And so I spoke to the other brother. He's Nubian. I said, listen, whoever's in charge, I want you to tell them that if you don't let Muhammad in, I'm going to go into that room and I'm going to announce to about a thousand black folk that black people can't come in to see Dr. Ben. Talk to them. Let them know because he's coming in with me today. And so long story short, they said, yeah, let him in because we don't need no trouble. So we, so we went in. The point I'm making is that Dr. Ben, we would meet in the church on 145th Street across from Convent Avenue Church. I think it's the Mount Zion Church. 
And um, no, no, it's no, it's another name. Mount Zion is another. I think it's another name. But but anyway, it's 145th Street. And Dr. Ben would meet us two weeks before we would go to Comet. And Dr. Ben from 1983, and I would imagine before that, he used he he would say, "I'll tell you where to spend your money. I'm gonna tell you where to spend your money with black folk, because they're gonna try to sell you Akhenaten's teeth. I'll tell you where to spend your money." And so for all of us who brought money, we spent it in a swan. We spent it with black folk. What happened was through the years of black folks spending money with black folk, Nubians had to be invited in economic meetings at that point because they were becoming as rich if not richer than most Indo-European Egyptians. So if you want to talk about how you can change the world, Dr. Ben changed the world. And that's a story that I've always told about Dr. Ben, even when he was with us. I used to tell that story all the time. And I would always tell Dr. Ben, Dr. Ben, please talk to us about that. Because I said that impacted me so much that I came to realize that you gave black folk in Egypt power. There was a community that we would always visit. That in the early days, Dr. Ben would go on and the, and the bus broke down. And the community brought everybody from the bus on and gave them water, gave them something to eat. And Dr. Ben always promised every time he came to Egypt, he would stop and give gifts to the community. That's what Dr. Ben did. He changed history. He changed the economics. Daboud was the name of the community. He changed the economic system by, by telling us, I'll tell you where to spend your money. Now, I ain't had a lot of money. I was a teacher. But whatever money I had, I spent with black folk in a swan. By the time I got up to Cairo, <laughs> I had to depend on the free meals. <laughs> So when you talk about the change of economics and the role that Dr. Ben has played, he changed history. And you say that they're still talking about him. I ain't been back since 87. So if they're still talking about him, you know the impact that he's had. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. His, his name still reverberates quite well throughout, throughout Egypt. Every time they see black people, there's black Americans. There's that association with, with Dr. Ben. It's, it's, it's classic. Family, please like, comment, and share. Um, please show your support in that way. If you can. Um, Brother Kaba, there's there's a couple other things, and we're going to kind of wind down, but I know it's getting kind of late. One thing that you said a little earlier, and I just want to just make sure that, you know, we, we fully address this. Um, you spoke of this system falling and don't save them like we did in 7-Eleven. How do we position ourselves effectively so we don't fall with the system? Because right now that's a little questionable. Um, but I just want to know what is your methodology in terms of, you know, us not sinking with the ship? Well, what I mean by that, of course, my brother Taki, is the fact that there will be certain give and take in moving forward. That, that's just the way it's going to happen. But what I would say that one thing that we do need to look at is the, is the work of the great um, Professor Neely Fuller in his book, um, The Compensatory Code of White Supremacy, and to look at the nine areas that he identifies as key places that we have been purposefully underdeveloped. I use the acronym REL CELL WEP, R-E-L, um, S-E-L, W-E-P. R stands for religion. We have to get ourselves together spiritually. 
That's why I wrote the book Spirituality Before Religions. Not to insult any religion, but I want to take you back before your religion existed. I want to take you back before the beginning began in your religion. And I want to show you that spirituality is unseen science and science is seen spirituality. I want you to understand that you are the creator having a human experience. And how you treat the creator's creations is how you treat the creator him herself. The first E is economics. We have to get ourselves together economically. We have to purposefully spend our money with our people. Purposefully. In whatever form it may take. Clothing. If you go to my Instagram page, you'll see that I I, I wear various clothing. Hey, man, uh, for the past uh, two days, Friday and Saturday, my grandson was wearing your happy hoodie. <laughs> okay? So when he walks into the place, he's bringing that image with him. We, 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 we need to start bringing that image with us. For a young 11-year-old to become 12 in November, for his buddies and friends in school to see him wearing clothes like that creates an image. And he wore it twice, so he must be proud. And so economics is the second. We have to be proud to, uh, to, to wear uh, Baba Heru jewelry, ancient aura. And to all the other jewelers who I may not name, we need to spend our money with them. We need to be proud of that. We, you know, we don't need to get caught up in gold because they're all cheating with gold anyway. So what you think is gold ain't gold. But we ought to be wearing our own legacy, period. This hoodie that I have on now, Mandingo Warriors, goes back to a day when I used to do classes in Harlem. I used to do it at a place called Soul Brothers Boutique. And this was the hoodie that I bought from, from the uh, Soul Brothers Boutique. Um, on 128th Street between Malcolm and um, Adam Clayton Powell. We, we, I'm still wearing it. And, and, and this goes back like 15 years. But I'm still wearing it. I'm still wearing our people's clothing. The first L is labor. You know, my son and I work together. Okay. What's important to me is we have to hire our own people. Dr. Amos Wilson used to always say, why do, why do our children have to respect us when every time they need to get something, they go to somebody else? Why should they respect us? When the basic needs that our children and our community need, they got to go to somebody else. We have to be able to hire our own. Now the S be called sex. I, I have a challenge with that because people sometimes get the word sex sort of kind of confused, particularly in this day and age. So I call it gender issues. Brothers and sisters, we got to get our relationships together. We have to come to understand black folk don't have a problem with relationships. We have a problem with commitment. You know, my wife and I have been married coming on, up on May, been married, uh, for 43 years. Okay. Everybody talk about love. You don't get married because you're in love. You get married because you're infatuated. <laughs> love <laughs> is when you want to walk away, but you don't because there's something bigger than you. It's not about I, me, and mine. It's about uh, uh, we, us, and ours. That's commitment to something larger. Now, I'm not talking about dangerous, toxic relationships. I'm just talking about relationships when people are getting, you know, it, it gets to a certain point where you just want to step outside. Well, guess what? Sometimes there's a storm outside, so you better stay indoors. Because what you find may not be what you think it is. Commitment. We as brothers and sisters have to get our relationships together. Now, I understand that we are from 
a background where we were never taught to have a relationship. We were enslaved, meant to work. Wasn't nobody trying to do that. We have to now return back to a way that we can create the kind of relationships that have commitment to an end. The E of cell, E is what I consider to be my lane, education. The second L is law. Praise to our attorney at war, Alton Maddox, Johnny Cochran. I could name all the other lawyers that are fighting and on the front line for what it is that we're doing. I'm also encouraging lawyers that when you're in law school, you better find you a Moorish brother to teach you Moorish law too. Moorish law is very important to understand. But the problem is sometimes we study Moorish law and we think we're going into court <laughs> with that knowledge that we, we think we know about Moorish law and we're going to defend ourselves. I don't think so. I think you need a lawyer that has gone through the process, but who also has studied Moorish law under some of the more brilliant minds. In so I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I have to ask this question. You just, you just brought up something very interesting. So if it's not, if it cannot be utilized in a court system, where couldn't, where can we use Morris law? Morris law can be used in the courtroom, but as a lawyer, you learn certain things. Like for instance, when you go into a court of law and because I have studied Morris law, I, I was with brothers back in the eighties and nineties who were children when noble Drew Ali was in charge of um, the uh, Moorish Science Temple of America. When you go into a courtroom and the judge says to you, do you understand why you're here? The moment you say, yeah, you in trouble. <laughs> no, Yana, I have no idea why I'm here. You say, well, I think your lawyer need to take you outside and explain. Lawyer take you outside and explain. You come back inside. He said, do you understand now? Your Honor, I have no idea why I'm here. There are fundamental things that if you knew would be very different the way you answer questions. Same way when someone arrests you. You know, Carol Taylor, beautiful sister. She wrote a book called The Little Black Book that had 30 rules. I I, I, I bought hundreds of them. And I, I use it in my reading class. I had 30 rules that every young black, her son was in middle school at the time. And she got together with Cut Em Loose Bruce, you know, Judge Bruce Wright. And they wrote this book that guided young black people, boys in particular, but girls too, as to how you should conduct yourself. For instance, right now, each and every one of us should know the name of the captain in the police precinct where we live. We should know the name. Because when you stopped, right, on the street, I'm talking about a young brother stopped on the street and the policeman may not have the best intentions in mind, but he, you know, he, he don't plan on hurting you, but he just doing what he do. And you say, oh, you know, that's interesting. Um, you, you know, because I've, I've, I've worked with captain Smith in the dare program, or I've worked with captain Smith in the police athletic league. I know your captain, that policeman will treat you very differently at that point. Cause if you know the captain and you know his name, and then you give the phone number. You should know the phone number of your police precinct. That's what Carol Taylor and Judge Bruce Wright recommended that every young person should know. Know your blood type. Because in the case of an emergency, if you're going to get a blood transfusion, save a lot of time if you know you're B positive. And so when, when you look at the law, Morris law can help you understand as a lawyer the other parts of law when you go into the um, cases itself. There are certain things that you know how to conduct yourself. Policemen stop you. Am I under arrest? Now, with everything going on now, I'm not quite sure. I'm going by what the book told us. But the bottom line is, sir, am I under arrest? And always, sir and madam, don't try to prove your manhood when, <laughs> when they stop you.
That's not the time to prove your manhood. The time to prove your manhood is in court. <laughs> when you get a lawyer like Alton Maddox or, or Johnny Cochran to defend you. Okay. There were just things that the book said about law that you should know. And so Moorish law helps you understand because Moorish law is part of the legal system, but it is not expressed the same way that it is expressed in this way. But if a, if a, a conscious black lawyer understands Moorish law and has gone to law school, when you put those things together, you're dynamite. Because you know things that even the other lawyers don't know. WEP, W-E-P, war, security, okay? Security. You can have everything in the world, but if you can't protect it, you only hold it on to it until someone stronger than you come and take it from you. You have to defend what you have by any means necessary. And so security, deacons of defense, Black Panther Party, whatever it may be. I am hoping one day in the near future, the Bloods and Crips will turn themselves around and understand exactly who they are and the role that they play in our community and that they will stop aiming the guns at each other and exactly know who the enemy really is. I pray for that day to come soon. The other E is entertainment. We got to get to our performers and bring back black culture in music and in politics. We have to grow our leaders in our community. And stop letting ones that just come in our community and ask our vote. Where you been? You know, I was on on one of the voting days. I was outside. I, you know, I had gone in, take, did what I had to do, and I came outside. A brother came up to me and said, "You know, uh, you know, I'm looking for your vote." But I said, "But who are you?" And he told me who I. I said, "Well, brother, why did you wait until today to come here? I never saw you in my life." You know. He, you have to let the community know. We have to grow our governing people within the community itself from when they're real young. We have to see those leaders that are out there, the ones that know how to express themselves. And so that they can begin to govern, because we, we're going to have to govern ourselves. Another time we can come on and we can talk about voting, because that's a whole nother game. Because See, as black folk, we're looking for people that, that like us. <laughs> We want our politicians to like us, okay? Family, guess what? Politicians don't like you. They don't respect you, but they need your vote, okay? My question is, where are you on reparations? Well, I haven't thought about it. Well, my answer is, well, when you think about it, come back and ask me about my vote. <laughs> it's just simple like that, okay? There are other things that we can come together on. But we're going to have to govern ourselves one way or another. So to uh, to say I'm not going to get involved is not the answer. Because to, to win it, you got to be in it. We got to figure out a way. You know, they asked Malcolm. Uh, it's like about a two minute. I, I have it up on my Twitter page. A reporter asked Malcolm, later in his life, he said, are, are you now saying that uh, black people should vote? And Malcolm said, no, I'm not saying black people should vote. What I'm saying is that black people need to become sophisticated in politics and understand how it works. See, this is what Reverend Adam Clayton Powell taught Malcolm about politics. And Malcolm began to realize ain't nobody moving ahead without understanding governance, with his, which is ma'at. So we're going to have to have a conversation. So before anybody tells anybody you should or should not do this, you must or must not do this, we have to have a conversation to know what we're talking about. We must become sophisticated in this. Now, those are nine areas. Rel, cell, web, religion, economics, labor, gender issues, uh, education, law, security, uh, entertainment, and politics. But I, I have respectfully requested, if I could add, a 10th area. And that's health and nutrition. Because if 
you can have all the other nine areas, but if you ain't healthy, hmm. it don't mean a thing. We have to reach out to Sister Ma'a, to Victor Bowman, Dr. Sebi's son, to the teachings of Dr. Sebi. We have to reach out to Queen of Fua. We, we, we have to study the work of Dr. Laila Africa. And we have to get this body together. Because if this body is sick, all those other nine areas are great. You can be as intelligent as you want. But if you're sick, it don't mean a thing. So we need to get our health together. And we need to be very careful as to how we conduct ourselves. And if we follow these 10 steps here, this is the formula for success for us and to keep us, this is, I guess, our life raft or to be able to build our own sustainable communities if we follow these 10 steps. I think that if we are aware that these are the areas that they try to disassemble and to underdevelop us, if we should pay attention to the spiritual aspects of religion, and if all of the ministers and imams and rabbis priests and whatever else they may be called come together create a program for black folk in the interest of black folk not your religion not your spiritual system if people who are into labor came together and tried to figure out a way how during the summertime young african-american youth male and female could be hired to work in the summertime in meaningful jobs If in education we came together and decided that we were going to put the curricula in place, not about what we believe, but what is good for our people, we can lock horns all we want, but we have to be one with the, with the end result. As it relates to gender issues, please, because I've done workshops on male-female relationships, don't start your relationship with everything I hate about you. Start it with everything I love about you. And then move to the areas that we need some help in. We need to start these, understand these areas. When see people say, well, it's so overwhelming. Where do we start? It you goes back to what you said earlier about playing the cards you were dealt. That's it. Start in those 10 areas. Start there. Look at that. Start thinking about those 10 areas. Rel, cell, web. And begin to bring some of the finest minds together to have. Remember we talked about Jim Brown and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. If, if they were to say, okay, we're going to identify those 10 areas. And, and I'm going to go out and I'm, and I'm going to go after all of the great spiritual leaders. Minister Louis Farrakhan. Okay. Bishop T.D. Jakes. No matter how you feel about them personally. This is no time to leave anybody out. Because if you leave somebody out, you're leaving thoughts out. We have got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. Everywhere I've studied our history, our downfall has been we fight amongst ourselves. That's what brought Kush Kemet down in the Sixth Dynasty. That's what brought it, the, the Middle Kingdom down. That's what allowed Cambyses and the Persians to come in. That's what ended the Moorish uh, uh, rule in in Granada in 1492, not only were we fighting amongst ourselves, it was family that was fighting amongst themselves. On the plantations, we fighting amongst ourselves. In our communities today, we're fighting amongst ourselves. We got this big argument about who created rap music. <laughs> That's, that is such a ridiculous juvenile. Brother, I, I grew up in the Amsterdam Projects, 63rd Street. And down the block, Amsterdam Avenue becomes 10th Avenue after 59th Street. And I grew up, this is around Hell's Kitchen, about 50th Street and 10th Avenue, there was a record company called Fania Records. It was started by a Dominican brother by the name of Johnny Pacheco and his lawyer, Jerry Masucci. Johnny Pacheco didn't like the fact that record companies was taking advantage of him. So he decided to start his own Latin record company with Jerry Masucci, which would bring Willie Colon, Larry Harlow, 
um, uh, Tito Puente, although he was known before that, but but Tito Puente, uh, Ray Barreto. I mean, you're going into all of these musicians that played Latin music. At the same time, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, like Don't You Worry About a Thing, that has a Latin beat to it. Black folk had music that had Latin beats to it, okay? But Latin music, salsa, was not created by foundational Black Americans. Foundational Black Americans contributed to Latin music, but they didn't create it. Bob Marley, in his interview with Gil Noble, I know that Gil, uh, when Gil asked him how did it start, and I, and I see King Simon up on, on, on so, I, so I know King Simon got something to say. But ska, ska was a very popular music. Jimmy Cliff and others really much, very much into it. Ska. And then you had soca, which was soul calypso. And then uh, he, he, he talks about, um, Bob Marley in the interview talks about uh, how uh, they used to listen to uh, Fats Domino from down south, Louisiana, and how uh, Fats Domino played the piano. If you listen uh, to Ain't, Ain't It a Shame or Blueberry Hill, if you listen to those songs, you'll you'll hear a da 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 beat, which is a back to front rhythm that was adapted into this beautiful collage of music that was coming up out of the English speaking Caribbean that would become reggae music. Marvin Gaye in his in his last album, Midnight Love, he tested it in sexual healing. He had a song called Third World Girl. Okay. And so Stevie Wonder had a song, uh, uh, Master Blaster, paying homage to Bob Marley. Foundational Black Americans contributed to reggae music. They didn't create it. Rap music. I was on the streets of the Bronx hmm. in 1979 when I started teaching at CES 70 on 174th Street, right by the Cross Bronx Expressway. The biggest song on the radio was Rapper's Delight. I was a disc jockey in my earlier years until I became a teacher. I grew up mixing music. The point I'm making is this, you have to know the difference between creation and contribution. Hip hop is not, well, let me put it to you like this. Hip hop is a culture. Rap is the vocalization of the culture. Hip hop came out of doo wop, Shep in the Limelights, okay? Does your mama know about me? Comes out of Motown. It comes out of this whole doo wop generation. Doo wop came out of bebop. Look, hip hop. Hip means like when we was growing up, we said, yo, man, that's hip. Like that's dope. That's how we said, oh man, that's dope. That's hip. Hop was a dance. They have a song. Let's go to the hop. <laughs> okay. Hop was a dance. Hey man, where you going? I'm going to a hop tonight. Hip hop was a smart or cool dance, which was the house parties that my father had in the 40s and in the 30s. House parties are not new. See, we don't know our history. So we get caught up when, they, when we get into fighting each other instead of celebrating. Fat Joe, big pun, Cool Herc. I remember Cool Herc. My school was right down the block on Cedric from him. The contributions that people outside of foundational Black American culture gave were phenomenal. But now they got us fighting each other over this. Because they know to divide us is to conquer us. Doo-wop came out of bebop. Bebop came out of rhythm and blues. Rhythm and blues came out of blues. Blues was sung on the plantation. And then you go back to Africa. So now when you look at rap music, all of our cultures of black folk have rapped. Make no difference, you Puerto Rican, whether you Jamaican, whether you from Trinidad or you from Haiti, we all rap. 
But rap music, as it relates to the United States of America, is foundational Black American. And just like I would never want to say that foundational Black Americans created salsa or created reggae, I do understand that the influence that our brothers and sisters have had on us from the Black diaspora, from the African diaspora, has had an impact on us. And it's a beautiful thing. So why are we fighting each other? Because we don't know the difference between creation and contribution. Mm -hmm. We must stop fighting amongst ourselves. And we have to come together. Yes, yes. Power and unity. That power is it. We have to stop. That's right. Puerto Rican, Dominican, we're all black. Okay, let's get it right. By matter of degree, we're all black. We all come from a culture that is based in Africa. It, it, it evokes itself in different ways. But the bottom line is, is that we're all the same. Let's just understand history and let us take credit for what we actually have created and be proud of what we have contributed to. Baba Kappa, it's the last one here. You spoke just a second ago about letters understanding history. Um, before the show, we kind of talked briefly about this. And I just wanted to just give a brief history so we can understand the context of the discussion. That they kind of alluded to some of this when we first started. But um, <clears throat> and, uh, when I first met you, or maybe about 25 years ago, at that time, you was introduced to me as uh, Booger T. Coleman. And as this uh, great educator, great scholar in the community, I believe I just go to a lot of your, well, not your earlier lectures. Well, when I earlier meet, during the early points of meeting you, um, you was giving lectures in, in Queens quite a bit. And I would kind of come to that lectures, things like that, and, and, and kind of learn um, quite a bit there. But I know maybe a few years later, um, the Kaaba Hiawatha Kamene and Booger T. Coleman, was it something that occurred at that point in the early 2000s that brought about that transition or the name change, or I mean, I'm not, I might not be saying it correctly, but could you just kind of walk us through that period? I was always proud of my name, Booker Taliaferro Coleman Jr. When Dr. Clark first met me, he said, oh, Booker T, you're gonna be a great teacher one day. <laughs> and I wasn't planning on being a teacher, but I remember him telling me that when, when they introduced, I was 12 and a half, we all went up to Harlem. And I was very you proud. So you met Dr. Clark when you was 12 and a half? 12 and a half, yeah, in Harlem. Wow. You know, old heads, you know, brought us up to Harlem during different things. Their parents knew our parents. They would put us on their bikes and, and they would take us different places to, to various lectures. They brought me to uh, Black Panther meetings. Uh, they brought me also to Nation of Islam meetings, things like that. You know, we, we call them old heads. You know, when I was like 11, 12, they would have been like 17, 18, both male and female. And so this one time they brought us up to Harlem and they sat us before this gentleman that was speaking. And at the end, they brought us up to meet him. And it was about five young people with us, uh, me included. And so they told us, they told him our names. And when they come to my name, Booker T. Coleman, he said, oh, you're going to become a great teacher. Oh, Booker T, you'll become a great teacher one day. And so I was always very proud of my name. I was always aware of the blackness of my name, Tuskegee Institute. My father was senior. I was junior. My father is from Tuskegee, Alabama and Marion, Alabama. And so I was always aware of what Booker T. Washington had done. My father had one of the original copies of Up From Slavery, a book that Booker T. Washington wrote. And so my, my idea, my concept was I was always very proud of my name growing up. But as I began to move into understanding as a child of the civil rights movement and growing up and understanding that names played a very important part, I began to realize that, you know, like um, this is a slave master's brand on me. Booker T might mean black, but Coleman, that's I, I don't know no black people named Coleman in Africa. And so it hung over my head as a cloud. And. I just did what I did throughout my life. But about 2000, 2001, 
I, I had uh, met a number of different people. And I uh, decided that, like, I just had to make a change. And in 2002, I went on sabbatical. And in going on sabbatical, I went through the process of correcting my name. Because of my closeness to my name, Booker T. Coleman Jr., I wanted to be careful as I moved. So when I spoke to shamans, elders, priests that would take me through the process of just thinking about the name that I would choose, one of the things that stuck out to me was they told me, don't choose a name that describes who you are. Choose a name that reminds you what your destiny is. So that every time somebody calls your name, you know what you're supposed to do. And so if you look at the first level, Kaaba is book Ka reversed. Kamene is related to coal man. Hiawatha was an indigenous brother from from northern New York that wanted to unite his people. Ka means spirit, Ba means soul. Hiawatha was a dreamer who wanted to unite the five, the five nations, the Onondaga, the Oneida, the Cayuga, the Seneca, and the Mohawk. He wanted to unite them so they would fight no more. And then Ka is spirit, and Mene is the first dynasty that, uh, that united upper and lower Kemet, Shmatawi. So my name, Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, means the spirit of the soul of the uniter. And so everything that we talked about as it relates to rap music and how we're fighting amongst ourselves and all the other things that I'm talking about, how we fighting amongst ourselves, what I'm attempting to do with the Bloods and the Crips and everybody else that wants to stand out there and do, I want to bring us together. I want to unite us as a people because it's something that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that is, when we fight amongst ourselves, we divide ourselves. When we divide ourselves, we can be conquered. The strongest thing that could stop somebody, when Hiawatha was talking to the five nations, what he did was that he picked up an arrow and he broke it. And he said, you see what happens with one arrow? And then he picked up five arrows representing all of the five nations. And he said, now look. And it was very hard to break those five arrows. So my point is, when you stand alone, you can be broken. But when you stand together, ain't nobody going to mess with you. So don't make a difference if you speak Spanish or French or Dutch. Whether you speak Patois of Haiti or the Patois of Jamaica or Trinidad. If you're black, you're black. And we have a common heritage in this part of the world. We must stop fighting amongst ourselves and we must start to support ourselves economically. We have to move that dollar into our communities. When you go to a presentation, the brother or sister is selling different things, make it so that they don't have nothing to bring home with them. That's right. Buy them out. Everything. And don't come to a presentation without expecting to pay money. Just spend money. <laughs> <laughs> come with some dollars in your pocket. Just understand that's part of our revolution. Is to give the money to all those who are doing this work. Because when you support us, we support you. Now, of course, I do know that there are charlatans. I know that there are people playing games and I know that there are pimpastas and pimpastas. I know pimpastas and pimpastas. Wow. That's a new one. <laughs> I know that. So it's up to us who are on the front lines of this work to demonstrate to you, the community that we for real, we're authentic and we're not playing games and I'm not going out like this. The price of freedom sometimes is death 
And when you lose your fear of death, you take away the most important bargaining chip that those who would wish to oppress you have. Because the strongest thing they have is they're going to kill you. But when that ain't in the that when when that's not in the negotiation, they ain't got nothing. But like I tell them, I'm prepared to live, and I'm ready to die. But I'm also ready to kill you. And so that goes back to the security. I'm not the type of person to to send wolf tickets out, brother Taki and sister Felicia. I'm not that type of person. I don't come on to people like this. I, I, I find it uncomfortable and I find it um, it's not worthy of a man or a woman to have to send out wolf tickets or threats. But you have to live a certain life that you want to live a leg. You want to leave a legacy for those that come before you. And I think our children are tired of watching us go through this. Okay. Okay, you want to march? Oh, oh, you know, all right. But damn, we marched 60 years ago. And where did it get us? Dr. Clark said the only thing that marching does is wears out the soles of your shoes. Where did it get you? You're marching again. Well, if it didn't work 60 years ago, what make you think is going to work now? And our young people are watching this. I've been with them, so I know. Young people are ready to get it on. They're not playing. They, they just don't really fathom the understanding of how to do it in a way that they can do what they need to do. And so I think as we start to develop this, brother, we, 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 look, we got to keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. It's just simple like that. Okay. And guess what? It's not about if we're going to get reparations, it's about when. And the longer it takes to get reparations, the higher the interest is going to be on that reparations. You already done wasted a whole bunch of years not giving it to us. The price is going up and it's going to continue to go up. So you might as well just give it up or let your grandchildren pay the price for what you don't have the courage to do. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I immensely enjoyed the discussion. I'm sure everybody in the chat did. Uh, please show Professor Kaba some love, family. Um, you see his cash app up here. Um, you also can get in contact through his Instagram. Um, please show this great scholar, this great elder some love. Um, give him his, we call him heartbeat props. Give him his flowers now. Don't wait. You know, the heartbeat props are important. And, um, you know, it's been a long time. We've been kind of going back and forth for a while. I'm trying to get this discussion done, um, but I'm glad we had the opportunity to do this tonight. I appreciate everyone um, that's hung out with us. It's it's after midnight now and here on the East Coast. I know folks are viewing from all over the world. Um, so uh, thank you so much for being a part of this. And again, Professor Kaba, thank you so much for being here. You know, we really enjoy you and we love you and we hope to have you back soon. And we got to have a different, we have to have a, next time around, we got to talk about Hiawatha. That's, it seems like a very interesting discussion. Um, so, yeah. So if you can just hang out a little bit um, and I'm going to close out and I'll be right backstage with you. So I want to just kind of say. Do um, you have any part, last words for the for discussion tonight? Anything you want to, anything last you want to share? I just want to tell young people something. In my experiences in my life, having gone through what I've gone through, I want the young people to know it's going to get better. I want them to understand. I'm not telling them to have hope because hope stands at the door of failure. I want them to know that it's going to get better. We must make this happen. And those that choose to make it happen is going to make it happen. I have a hundred year plan. I have a plan for those young people, great, great, great grandchildren that I may never know. My question to us is, how will they call your name in a hundred mm. years? In the year 2123, what are they going to be saying about us? 
They'll see Hoppy. This will be recorded. They'll see in this interview. They'll see what we're doing. And this will help them get where they got to get. So don't give up. It's going to get better. Hmm. But it's up to us to make it happen. So keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Solar power is the future wealth of the planet. All power to the people. All power to the people. Peace, my brother. Family. Uh, <clears throat> wow. Again, underscoring the importance of the economics, understanding the importance of understanding the origins of economics and how it relates to what we're doing. Um, also, um, February 16th to the 25th, I'm going to start here because that's what this brings us back to that and connecting the dots, making it real, making it plain. Um, for me and those, Felicia and all of us that's here in the happy team, just going and marveling is and looking is, is, is it's, it's cool. It's, it's great. But out, without having a plan to get us to that next level, as Professor Kaba so eloquently stated, it's almost like a waste of time. So we used to take this history or learning this history we have here and connecting it with our economic legacy and tying it into the people that's gonna be there with us on the trip, the Info DC Jehutimes and Dr. David Anderson and others um, to talk about the history and also the economics is for me what makes this real for us in a very meaningful way. It can't get no more plain than this. So if you're on the fence, um, Akhetours.com, go sign up, register, give us a call. We'll work it out with you in the best way we possibly can. Also, family, we have our clearance sale on all merchandise. Definitely support the mission, support what we're doing. Um, you can go get some mer merch. Everything's been marked down. Um, a lot of people have since we've kind of announced this have shown their support. We appreciate you guys. We love you guys for all the support and love that you show. Same thing with those people in the cash apps and uh, other various different types of donations, the likes, the comments, the shares, everything that you guys do in the happy movement is very meaningful to Felicia and I, and we, we appreciate and we love you guys immensely. You just don't understand how much um, this keeps us going because this work is not easy. Um, life, because life keeps happy. Life keeps lifing, and and the support that you guys give is is just is can't be overstated so um it's please you know continue to do that and we'll continue to show you guys love we continue to, to keep doing the work that we're doing um again uh 40k is is the goal uh see we just hit thirty two thousand. thank you for all those people who've um subscribed to us on youtube um please help to get the word out to get it up to 40k and say thank you to all those people who are following us on facebook instagram and twitter as well and family, again, I just want to say thank you, everyone who hang out, hung out tonight. I know it's kind of late. We had a nice, nice crowd in the building, and uh, it was a very powerful discussion. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again in the very near future. With that, we're going to say peace and hold tap. Embark on the transformative Hoppy 2024 tour and witness the remarkable evolution of economics, from the cultivation of crops to the dynamic world of stocks. Immerse yourself in the birthplace of commerce as we unveil the ingenious minds behind the first elaborate economic plans. Join us in Egypt from February 16th to the 25th, 2024 to experience this awe-inspiring journey where you will see and learn about innovations in agriculture. Marvel at the grand structures like the pyramids and the great temples, symbols of wealth and economic prowess in ancient Egypt. Experience the enchantment of Egypt with a chartered Nile cruise exclusively for our group. At the pinnacle of our tour, you will be granted access to the prestigious Hoppy Dinner Gala, where you can network with fellow travelers, scholars, and enthusiasts. Enjoy a night of opulence and culture as we unite to shape a prosperous future. Book now and join Hoppy on our economic tour of Egypt. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?